Hello. <laughs> I know we're the last presentation right before the raffle, so we'll try to keep it quick. Tonight, John and I are going to talk about our transition to payments services at Airbnb. My name is Sophie. I'm a product manager on the payments platform team at Airbnb. I'm John. I'm an engineer on the payments team. <laughs> this is Brian Chesky, one of Airbnb's founders. If you ever have a chance to grab a drink with him, I would highly encourage you to ask him about Airbnb before we had an online payments platform. So he'll tell you crazy stories about showing up to people's houses and not having any cash, not having money to pay the host. It was very awkward. Basically, you can sum it up by saying that you are exchanging cash with a stranger in their bedroom. <laughs> it's not exactly what Airbnb is all about. We really want to move the monetary part of the uh, Airbnb experience to the background to allow guests to focus on having fun, hosts to focus on hospitality, and everyone to really focus on something other than the transaction. So when we think about the Airbnb payments platform at Airbnb, we really focus on being less transactional and more human. What does this mean? It means that if you're paying on Airbnb or if you're being paid, we don't want you to think about the transaction. We want you to think about what you're doing offline in the real world. How does this apply to our payment systems? This is uh, circa 2008. It looks pretty simple, right? We've got one way to be paid and one way to get paid. If you're thinking about how to make a transaction less transactional, if you will, you want to make sure that guests and hosts are able to get paid in their local currencies and in ways that are familiar to them. If you have to find an obscure routing number or if you have to pay in a currency that you're not familiar with, you'll be thinking a lot about the transaction. So one of the first ways that we tried to make our platform more human was by integrating with a ton of payment processors. We just went for it. And we were on a monolithic Rails app, and it started to look like a cloudy day. And each of these processors had a unique integration, the huge amount of duplication of code for things like charge. We also had a lot of uncomfortable realizations when we tried to do pretty basic things like processor redundancy across different payment processors. So one of our first services at Airbnb was a payments gateway. So this is an internal gateway that we used to standardize all processor calls like charge, batch pay. It was a huge success for us. It really simplified things. It made it a lot more efficient and easier for us to integrate with new processors. So when Airbnb started thinking about the end-to-end -end trip, that is beyond just a unique place to stay, but also booking an experience with a local or a transportation, how you get there. Who knows what we'll come up with next in the end-to-end -end trip. But we knew on the platform team that we did not want to have a bunch of unique, bespoke APIs calling our payments gateway. We wanted to standardize, so we have an order management system. This is a standardized way for a transaction to be communicated to the payments gateway. And the payments gateway handles the money movement to the processors. This is a hugely simplified diagram of our service-oriented architecture. John will get more into the details. But I wanted to circle back to our motto. So less transactional, more human. With the payments platform, we can very quickly build new features that allow us to further this vision, be it more local processors or uh, more opportunities for entrepreneurs on our platform. However, you can't move the transaction to the background if something goes wrong. If you get double charged or if there's a glitch in the system, you're going to start thinking about that transaction again. So we realized, in addition to less transactional, more human, every transaction matters. What do I mean by this? <laughs> uh, I have some uh, younger brothers, and we like to play a game called uh, Would You Rather. So one fun Would You Rather is, would you rather double pay a host or double charge a guest? Personally, I would rather be double paid. And that actually happened to me about a year ago. We were doing some testing, and I got triple paid as a host on Airbnb. It was a great day for me, a terrible day for service-oriented architecture at Airbnb. And John is going to talk about a solution that we had to this problem. So something Brian Chesky also probably said was data integrity in distributed systems is really hard. But every transaction still matters, and everything has to be accounted for. So how do we go about that? So you can look at SOA almost like a distributed database, only that the nodes aren't homogenous. Um, so the system as a whole holds the state of a payment at any one time. But eventual consistency means that there can be a point in time 
where a person can see different values and states across different nodes, but eventually the system will settle on the correct values for a given payment. So for example, our processing service, so we paid out our hosts as normal, but we had a huge data pipeline issue, so our billing and financial reporting services didn't know about the successful payouts until much later. So in this example, only one node in our pay payment system knew about the payouts, and it took a long while for the rest of the nodes to figure that out. So this could have really bad side effects. It could really uh, severely impact our community. So our billing service could easily have paid out our hosts multiple times. <laughs> and we've seen tons of examples like this in the past where you know, nodes have different data that just doesn't agree with each other. So why do values differ? Well, nodes can die. Um, they can lose connectivity. Uh, requests fail, and they time out, right? So especially in the huge system of multiple network requests. Uh, there are multiple ways where systems can self-heal and repair this uh, inconsistent data, and uh, one of the ways is write repair, which I'll be diving into. So write repair is where every write call attempts to repair an inconsistent state. So our payment systems consist of multiple clients and servers, and some services are both. They can fire multiple uh, write requests to a server, like making a charge, and get the most recent state of a payment. So here you'll see that the successful status of a payment eventually propagates back to the client, even if the first few requests failed initially. But how do we avoid charging the guests multiple times if we make multiple payment requests? Well, we need a fancy magical buzzword called idempotency. Now, idempotency means that I can make a single call repeatedly, and I can get the same result. So in other words, making multiple identical requests would always give me the same, or would have the same effect as a single request. So we implemented an idempotency framework, and it consists of these general principles. So clients pass an idempotency keys that uh, represent a single idempotent request. We have one database commit each for the request and response. We keep database transactions completely separate from network calls, or RPCs, which I'll go into later. Clients have to be smarter and have their own auto retry mechanisms. And we categorize their errors as retriable or non-retriable, so clients know whether or not it's safe to retry themselves. So the framework is based on the assumption that our request can be separated into three distinct phases. We have the pre-RPC, RPC, and the post-RPC phase. RPC means remote procedural call, and that's generally when I can make a live call to a service uh, over a network. So if you take this charge request, for example, in the pre-RPC phase, I can store item potency information, uh, record the request in the database. RPC phase, I can call it down to your service and actually charge the payment. And in the post-RPC phase, I can record the response and return it to the caller. And you'll notice that we're trying to avoid mixing any database interaction with network calls because network calls are inherently unreliable. So what happens if I get this request twice, or 20 times, or even 200 times? Uh, what happens if it's a retry, basically? So we can use the item potency key. So in the pre-RPC phase, we can look for the item potency key. If it exists, we know it's a retry. And then we look for the response and return it to the caller if it's present. And then the request ends there. Otherwise, we go to the RPC phase where we can do some item point checks with a downstream service, such as querying a payment to see if it's charged yet. And then we record the response and return it to the caller. So by combining database commits and keeping them contained, we can keep things atomic. And we can always make sure of where we are in the request lifecycle. So for example, if we didn't combine them and I failed between B and C or G and H, it's almost impossible to figure out where in the request I failed and quickly recover from that. But by combining them, I know that I failed in either one or two, and I can quickly recoup from that. And again, we're separating out the network requests from the database work, because network requests are always prone to failure. So we want to completely isolate that. Clients now have an increase of responsibility. They need to be smarter. So they, they need to ensure that items and keys are unique, and clients use the same ones for retries. They need to persist them. Um, they also need to have their own auto retry mechanisms with, mechanisms with different strategies, such as jitter or exponential back off, depending on their needs. Uh, they also need to know whether it's safe or not to retry based on the errors it consumes. And also, request payloads can't be mutated. Otherwise, that would break the definition of item potency. So they have to be identical for retries. So for clients to be able to consume errors, servers need to propagate the right kinds of errors. So we, we separated our exceptions into retriable and non-retriable. Retriable exceptions are transient, so we expect an error, uh, a retry at a later time to give a different result. So this could be database or network issues or server downtime, uh, anything in the 500s. 
Non-retrieval exceptions are not transient. So we expect a later retry to give back the same error. So this could be uh, invalid input, validation errors, uh, 404s, anything in the 400s. So the service has been great, uh, but there are definitely some, some trade-offs that we've seen, you know, lots of learnings that we've taken away from this. The most important thing is that the scope of complexity increases. Um, so basically, clients need to be smarter. They need to be much more complex. They need to know about all these things, such as idempotency keys, handling exceptions, having these auto reach mechanisms implemented, and so on. Developers. Deve developers need to have much more context and be much more pr prudent navigating around the code and testing it. For us, it was not a trivial task going through each of the requests and meticulously splitting them up into these three different phases. Also, uh, we needed to exercise good judgment when handling exceptions, such as um, null pointer exceptions. Null pointer exceptions from a database client during outage can mean something completely different from a null pointer exception from a, a request field, for example. With that being said, the solution has been great for us. Um, I mean, there are many other ways to solve challenges like this, but this works for us because it's generalizable and lightweight across our many services. So if I were to spin up a new service, I could just import this library, and immediately I would have a layer of item posy logic kept separate from application-specific models and classes. But yeah, this is just one of the ways that we keep our systems consistent. Like John said, this has been great for Airbnb. Specifically, it has given the framework for engineers to make sure that every transaction matters. It's also been great for our community because it allows our community to focus on the hospitality aspect and we can make payments less transactional and more human. Thank you.